Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, I want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue on, yes. we've been looking at Babylon, that mother of harlots, mm -hmm. uh, and how it's affected and infected the Christianity of today. And the reason we're doing that is to look at it and find what's wrong solely for the purpose of getting back to what's right. Okay? Back to the root. Get back to the root. Be radical. Hallelujah. So last week, uh, what we were talking about is the theology of Babylon and how that's come into the theology of modern Christianity. So I want to, we're going to talk about, let me just say this to get started, all right? This is founded on the dream that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had that, that Daniel interpreted, you know, with him being the head and then the four kingdoms. The four kingdoms were Babylon, modern Iraq, mm -hmm. and then Persia, modern Iran, Greece, which has affected all of the world with, with its philosophy, and finally the Roman Empire, which is the religious world power at the end here. And we talked about Babylonian th theology, and we've talked about salvation by works, the centrality of the building, the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. and the authority of the doorkeepers, that priesthood that uh, is not the priesthood that God has called for. And finally, misdirected worship. And that's where we are now. We're going to look, we're going to start uh, in this program looking at misdirected worship. But before we do that, I'm going to once again ask Brother Mark if you will ask God's blessing on our time together. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come here and listen to your word. Just proclaim it and let us see new things in it so we can absorb it in our spirit and express it to, be, to other people. Amen. 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 To be equipped for the work of service. Amen. Hallelujah. So as I said, we're going to talk about misdirected worship, that, that fourth thing that I said is a part of the theology of Babylon. But you know, long before Babylon, long before the Tower of Babylon, long before the Kingdom of Babel, you had when, when God used Moses mm -hmm. to bring the people of God out of bondage in Egypt, right? right? They went through, you know, you all know the story, they came through the parted Red Sea and God did a wonderful miracle there. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a miracle working God. And they went off into the wilderness. And then the Lord called Moses up on the mountain to give him the commandments, right? Yes. And as he was coming back down after 40 days up on the mountain with, mm -hmm. in the presence of God, and Joshua met him on the way down, they heard a sound. And Joshua said, well, it's, you know, it's the sound of war. And Moses said, no, it's the sound of singing that I hear. It was music. And when he got down, he found that the people had, had built under, under Aaron. Now, Aaron was the high priest, or was the priest, and had been left in charge by Moses. Mm -hmm. And the people were now worshiping a golden calf. Mm -hmm. This is the people of God who has just seen this incredible power of the Almighty God. And they've right? seen it over and over and, and over. Now, and what they're doing is they're worshiping this golden calf. So Moses rebukes him quite well, thank you, yes, he does. in the name of the Lord. And as he's doing that, his brother Aaron, Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. Mm -hmm. That's Exodus 32, 22. Well, that's not a justification. It's not an excuse. Not an excuse, but I'll tell you what, it's probably accurate. Yes, that the people, and this is the people of God that he's talking about, are prone to evil. It's our flesh. It's a constant conflict between our flesh and our spirit. That's what Paul talked about a lot, right? And fallen mankind is set on evil. And we are supposed to be set on the path to righteousness. But, well, 
So anyhow, get back to the to the Babylonian kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, now, as I say, we've talked about this, and we've talked about it from Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, after he gets this interpretation of his dream through the revelation of God through Daniel, right? The next, that's in chapter 2 of Daniel. The next thing you see is in chapter 3 of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, sets up this giant statue of gold to be worshipped, right? Yes. This giant statue, uh, incredibly large statue of gold in the image of himself. himself. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Oh. Are you sure about that? Okay. I thought so. Actually, Scripture doesn't indicate that at all. Really? It, the, the simple fact of the matter is, the Scripture doesn't reveal at all. Who the statue was. What the what? Statue, who or what the statue was of. Ah. Okay? It just says the king made an image of gold. It, may, but it doesn't say what it was. No. Now, I, I hear you know, a lot of yeah, people right. assume that he had made a statue of himself. Right. But that is an assumption. It's conjecture. It's speculation. Okay. The Word of God doesn't reveal it. But let me tell you what the Word of God does say. So if you go to Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 4 through 7, right? Okay. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Hmm. Uh, you know, that may just be a bit of patriotism. Oh, yes. Okay. Like Caesar, remember yes. Caesar many times said, you know, the, the people, all the people in the Roman Empire had to proclaim that Caesar is Lord. And Christians would not, and so many Christians were put to death, persecuted for that. And, you know, the Romans couldn't understand that quite, because to them, where there are so many, where there are so many gods, yes, yeah. you know, what difference does it make if you worship this God or another God, there's so many. They didn't mind if you, you proclaim Jesus as Lord or Jesus as God. As long as you're willing to also proclaim Caesar as Lord. And they were not. They were not exclusive. Well, and the people of God, the Jews and the Christians, yes. were very much, and were supposed to be, very exclusive. There is one God, one way. and only one way. And that's one of the first things you need to know about worship, is there's only one God, he's the only object of worship. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the three young men, they would have known the commandments of God. These are Jews. They were pulled. They were taken from Judah. They knew the commandments of God, and they proved themselves faithful to his commands at the very risk of their lives. I'm sure you all know the story of the, of the three young men, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they refused to bow down and worship the statue, so they were tossed into the furnace. The three of them went into that furnace, and the four of them marched around. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I have a question now. Think about this. Mm -hmm. Why did the Lord who gives us everything pertaining to life and godliness, as he says in, you know, the Apostle Peter says in Second Peter. Why did he not reveal what the statue represented? Whether it was Nebuchadnezzar or uh, one of his, Nebuchadnezzar's gods, all right? He didn't want to nail it down to the specific thing. The, because the, there's a lot of different things that no, you could worship. No, it's, not, it's not how many different things you could worship. The real answer is very simple. It doesn't matter. Okay. If you're worshiping anything, anything else, anybody else. other than God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it is an abomination. Right. Right. So it doesn't matter what the, what they what it represented, because it doesn't. You know, there's nothing that you can worship except God. the Lord God and Almighty, Maker of heaven, and it wasn't God. Right. Regardless of what it was, the one thing I can tell you, it wasn't, it wasn't the statue of God. Right. So. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. All right, I'm going to read the Ten. I'm, I'm just going to read the, a couple of verses from Exodus 20. Okay. I'm going to start at verse three. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath 
or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Mm. You get that? Yes. I don't want to hope That's I can fly by. Clear. Okay. That's very clear. How about, is this clear? It covers about everything. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what's in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the water. Okay? Right. Now I want you to know. What else is there? Well, <laughs> that's the point. You're not supposed to make any, any likeness of those. We have basically 90 years of history in the New Testament. All right? Roughly. Throughout the New Testament, there is no mention of statues or other forms of images, yeah. either of Jesus or the apostles or Mary, the mother of Jesus. None in Scripture. Okay? Mm -hmm. But there is a simple warning that spoke, God spoke through John, the apostle, in 1 John 5, 21, when he says, Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Mm -hmm. All right? Yet still... In the time of Isaiah, let me go back to the time of Isaiah. Would the Lord not have to say to those who are called by his name today like he did back then? And I'm, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 5, 6, and 8, right? Okay. God spoke to Isaiah and said, Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For thou hast abandoned thy people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with influences from the east. And he goes down and says, And their land has also been filled with idols. They worship the work of their hands, that which their fingers have made. Talking about the people of God. Yes. Where did this come from? Influences from the east. Yes. Greece, Rome. Well, to the east. No, no, that's going to the west. It's you know what's to the east? Okay. Babylon. Babylon, Babylon. Persia. Those were the lands to the east. They still are. Yes. So those influences, the Word of God is saying those influences of, of making idols came from the east. Hmm. All right? One of the great influences of the east was what's called iconography. 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 <laughs> that's, hmm. that's statues. Paintings, relics, those are all it's things common to the pagan religions. Yes. Right? What are they? They are all images of things either in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth. Things right? we should not be worshipping. Look at Paul in Athens. In, you know, in the book of Acts, Paul talks about how his spirit was provoked as he walked through Athens, that third kingdom in that statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because of the idols that he yes. saw everywhere, yes. right? So, if I'm talking about iconography, I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm saying that right. Anyhow, mm -hmm. icons, 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 icons are, like I said, they're the, they're the statues, the paintings, the, the relics. Okay, they're the things that people want to see in touch. Objects right? of worship. They are the things made by the hands of man, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? But they, so now, you don't have to be a, a theologian or a brilliant scholar or have been saved for a thousand years to recognize the fact that they permeate much of what's called Christianity today. Yes, they do. Okay? But that didn't gain widespread acceptance in the church until the time of the Emperor Constantine. Okay, and, and I have been saying all through this, this program that, that is one of the greatest turning points in Christianity. Now, obviously, there, you know, there are things that lead up to it, but all of a sudden, in the time of Constantine, who I believe is a, the true founder of the Holy Roman Empire, mm -hmm. right? which is different than the Roman Empire, and different what most people think of the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages. All right? mm -hmm. it, it started in the time of Constantine, and it exists, exists today. And I don't know if you, how much of this history you know, but his mother, Helen, mm. who went to Jerusalem, she seems to me to be the mother of relics. Yes. Okay? Coming back with a piece, piece of the of true cross. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But that was never without controversy. All right? Even back in the, in the early 700s, uh, Leo III was the emperor okay. of the empire. And he was basically the Byzantine Empire, right? Which was the Roman Empire. 
And he had proclamations and edicts against icons, mm. wanted them all destroyed. Okay. Because, well, I can't say what was in his mind, but he wanted all of this because by that time, remember, I'm talking about in the year like in the early 700s, all the statues, the paintings, these these relics had become commonplace in Christianity. And didn't God command all the people whenever they went into a, a land and conquered it that they were just destroy, destroy them everything, all. Yes. everything? But now they're building yeah. the work of their fingers. But that's think about what he said to mm -hmm. Isaiah, right? Yeah. So Leo was in. Uh, he was born in six eighty five and died in seven forty one, and he made a ruling that all of these icons throughout the church be destroyed. Well, that didn't go very far because the Pope came out and stood against that and wound up displacing him, actually, right? And then later on in the Protestant Reformation, you know, one of the early leaders, you had Martin Luther, who basically God used to start the Protestant Reformation, but right immediately following that, immediately, was John Calvin, right? John Calvin uh, lived from 1509 to 1564, and he was one of the prime moving forces in early Protestant uh, development, mm -hmm. right? Like Calvinism? Yes, Calvinism, but he, he affects more than just, it is Calvinism, and you know, it, it affects a lot of Christianity today. Right. But he absolutely stood in opposition to icons, again, against statues, artwork, and relics. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not an attitude that was shared by Martin Luther, uh, who remained a bit more attached to his Catholic roots. Well, that's just the truth. Yeah. If, if you're not Catholic or one of the religions that is into relics, you probably don't understand the power of this, where people literally travel the world and go on pilgrimages to touch the bone of a dead saint or the you know drop of blood or a drop. I, I really don't want to go there. I mean, to me, this is... That's a bondage that they're under. Well, it's, it's an abomination, but yes. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into that. You, you listen. If you're listening to this, you need to seek God on your own. Remember that, Absolutely. and have conversations with Him, as I did. I, I've said this before. You know, I was raised a, a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, the only schools I ever attended as a child and as a teenager and going to uh, college preparatory school uh, were, were Catholic schools. And when I got saved, I actually went to Catholic seminary and did graduate work in sacramental theology and in Old Testament scriptures. I've been in places where when I first was saved, I was doing the things that had been common to me, normal to me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it dawned on me one day, I felt like, oh my goodness gracious. And I know Alice was with yes. me and had the same experience. Yes. This is idolatry. Oh, yeah. This is not okay. Right. But that's between you and the Lord. Yes. But pay attention to this misdirected worship. You see, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to a distant place or do a pilgrimage to be blessed by the Lord. No, absolutely not. Or to worship. Okay. Listen to what Jesus said. And now I'm going to read from Luke 17, okay. verses 20 and 21. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming... Jesus answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You see, the power, and that's why people go seek, they go to these, they go to Lourdes, they go to Fatima, they go to, to Bosnia, these uh, so-called holy places. Yes, because they're looking for the power of God. They're looking for a touch of the power of God, mm -hmm. right? But the power of God resides Amen. in you. Amen. The kingdom of God is in you, but you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is within you. The power of God is within you. You don't have to go any place. No, he's, he's equipped us. All you have to do is go into that obedience, right? And he, the Holy Spirit, gives you the power to worship. And I'm telling you that it takes power to worship. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, okay. says this. And I'm reading from the New American Standard, right? I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, I, I, I've said this, and you, the word that's used for service in the King James, and in the King James it stops there, but that word is translated over and over and over in the Greek, in the New Testament, as worship. Okay, So, presenting your body a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, that is your, your spiritual service of worship. Worship is surrendering to God, serving God, humbling yourself before God, that's worshiping in spirit and in truth. As Jesus said to the woman in the well, no, she wasn't was in the well. At the well. The woman at the well. <laughs> when he said that the fathers will seek those who worship him in spirit and in truth, right? You see, true worship is an attitude. True worship is an attitude of the heart. Yes. Okay? Now I want to read to you and... Please, by the way, if you're, not, if you're not sitting there reading a Bible and looking at this, please make notes so you can go check these out and spend a little time. Because, you know, faith comes by hearing, but you've got to hear from God. All right? I just, I just want to kind of prod your spirit and encourage you to go spend time reading these words and conversing with the Lord. That's called prayer, conversing with the Lord about them. Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. A surrendered heart, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Okay? That is worship. A living Amen. and holy sacrifice. True worship. Is that not true worship? Yes, it is. You know, it, it says in Psalms, come let us worship and bow down. Mm -hmm. But before that it says, you know, we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen Jerusalem, you've got to understand the old city of Jerusalem. You know, you go into the gates and into the old city and into the temple area. And so it, it, you're supposed to go in there with thanksgiving. Yes. Once you get there, that's a place of praise. Amen. But the goal for me in my life, and I pray for you in your life, is we want to be in the Holy of Holies. Yes. Because that's where the presence of God is, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what worship is about. So Jesus did that. On the night he was taken, before the Last Supper, he took the bread, his body, broken. Yes. He took the cup, his blood, and said, this is the blood that's going to be, because it's a sacrifice of blood. Yes. And then when, so he, he, then he went out after the, at the Last Supper, and it says that he went out with the others singing yes. praises to God. Singing hymns, because that was what was done on Passover, as a particular... And if you study, you can find the, the, the actual yeah, the great Psalms, Hallel. the great Hallel, right? Mm. So he went from thanksgiving to praise, and from there, where did he go? He went to the cross. That is the ultimate, ultimate worship. All right? So I, I, I want to talk a bit about the evidence that so much worship is done wrong and directed wrong, and the dire consequences of that all too sad fact. Mm. You gotta understand this. Alright? In Romans chapter chapter one, and you're gonna have to spend time and read all through this. But I'm gonna read through it quickly. Romans one, I'm gonna start reading at verse twenty. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Images there. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts, 
to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. I want to tell you, there is an, listen, if you're in, if you've been in the United States recently, what have you seen? I mean, you know, it just became the law of land recently. Mm-hmm. Homosexual marriage. Look at the, the acts of violence we've had. Yes. Somebody walks into a church and murders people. Somebody walks into a, poli- you know, by a recruiting station and murders. I mean, all over. But it wasn't because of the Supreme Court that this happened. Yeah. It wasn't because of your local or national politicians. It wasn't because of racism. We have this homos- this explosion of homosexuality, of abortion, murder, rebellious youth, greed, and far more because of misdirected worship. worship. Because they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. That is the root cause. And if you are a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a Bible-believing, spirit-filled you have to come to understand that, that that is the cause of what these things, of these things going on. And how does that happen? Because people have chosen to listen to the enemy, the devil, rather than to God's word. There's an answer to that. I want to go back to worship. When Jesus was out in the wilderness and was tempted by that devil, it says in, in Matthew 4, 8 through 10, Again, the devil took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. By the way, that's some prosperity preaching for you. (laughs) Yes, it is. Just do this little thing and you can have everything, all of, the, all of the riches of the world. Jesus, as always, responded with the word. And if you look at those three temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, it's building up. Towards because the goal for Satan is to get him to worship him. Mm. The goal is worship. The goal in Christianity is worship. Amen. God is seeking, the Father is seeking those who will worship in spirit and in truth. So I pray, and we'll have to cover a little more of this next week, but I pray that we would be that people of praise and that people who worship God in spirit and in truth and understand the difference. Lord, that we would, that we would with our every bit of our lives, be presenting ourselves as a living and a holy sacrifice to you, Lord God. Because all we're doing is returning what you have given to us, our lives. That year. Well... Praise God. Until next time, may God use you for the glory of his name. God bless you and goodbye. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners